how do we think about money? How do we think about wealth? How do we think about markets, about the way in which we go about buying things and selling things and producing things and consuming things? The way in which this is usually described or proscribed is called economics. And the theory of economics that more or less rules the world today comes from what is called standard or standard neoclassical economics. It's my contention that this way of thinking about economics is very powerful, very dangerous, and the way in which it organizes our thinking about the world and how we think about ourselves and how we think about the buying and selling things, our model of who we are and how we operate um, in our economic activities is very dangerous and it is one of the main elements in the struggle that we're finding to try and deal with learning how to live on a finite planet. What I'd like to propose is an alternative which is called ecological economics and ecological economics is a counterpoint to the model of standard neoclassical economics. In order to describe what ecological economics has to offer, I need to do some of the history of economics, where economics comes from as an idea, some of its history, and how ecological economics has come about to provide an alternative to what, as far as I can tell, is a way of thinking about our learning to live on this planet, which is fundamentally dangerous. Economics, as a term, has a long history. The word itself comes from the Greek, oikos, meaning home or house, and nomos, meaning law. So the laws of the house are the laws of economics. And this term and the first real descriptions of how an economic system functions, at least in the West, came through philosophers, Greek philosophers, two and a half thousand years ago, like Aristotle, Plato, and Xenophon. And they laid down um, ways of thinking about how we can buy certain things, about what trading is, how do I transfer a, uh, a desire to buy shoes when I'm talking to somebody who only has an ox to offer. How do I determine what the value is of one of these versus the other? How can I trade them both into money or credit? And how does that work in markets and so on? And out of this would eventually come the discipline of economics. Starting in about 1200 or 1300 in the Middle Ages, new developments in economics began to happen in the actual physical way in which people were buying and selling. And these were markets. They were merchant markets, usually in small cities. And every uh, year or so, they would have uh, festivals and gatherings in places like Frankfurt and Paris and Venice and Florence and so on in Europe. And as they were doing this, complications arose. And one of the complications that arose was, if I come from London with a bunch of sheep and I'm trying to sell them in Florence, um, and I sell them in Florence and the money that I get is in Florentine money uh, and can I buy them or sell them with Florentine money when I come from England and France and so on. This is when we get into the whole questions about exchange and, and what's the value of stuff that's in money that's in London as opposed to Paris or Venice and so on. And the people who worked on this were called bankers. They sat on benches initially in these markets and people would come to them and say, I will give you this amount of money or this amount of sheep for whatever the, the value is in this country and so on. And it's the foundation of the banking system. And if you go to the airport and get money changed, it really goes all the way back to this period of about, let's call it, say, 1300 and so on in Europe. This was the foundation people started to think about, not just um, banking, exchange, how to, how to value monies in different ways but also banks would take the money that you might be depositing there temporarily because you'd sold sheep but nobody wanted to buy them at the moment and so you got some money for it and you put it into a bank in Florence or you might ask them whether or not you could take the money that was in the bank in Florence and actually send it to a colleague of yours in, in France and so on. These were networks of exchange that were developed. 
And then the merchants themselves began to develop different ways, some of it derived from uh, the Arab world, of, uh, of accounting, about thinking about different forms of bookkeeping and how to think about debits and credits and so on. So we began to get a development of a really complex way of thinking about the monetary system. And with the arrival of international trade on a grand scale, with the um, discovery of North and South America, and other parts of Asia and Africa, we get um, real questions about what would it mean to invest large amounts of money in, in ships that were going to go to different parts of the world or armies or other things like that and, and what were advantages and disadvantages of trade and whether one should keep gold on hand and so on. And this again um, helped to get people to think about whether or not economics itself, a description of how the market system was really up to the task of um, not just describing how an economic system worked, but actually making appropriate policy choices for kings, rulers, and princes um, all the way through Europe and in other parts of the world. Beginning in the 18th century, this way of thinking about um, how to analyze and uh, explain the dynamics of markets and how people bought and sold and how money develops um, became the focus of a group of people who were the first people to be really called economists. Two of those people, right at the very beginning of this modern way of thinking about uh, economics, were the physiocrats and a guy called Bernard de Mandeville. Physiocrats were French. Their leader was a man called Francois Quenet. And what the French physiocrats were interested in was, how would you describe an economic system at work? And what they did was they looked particularly, because of their particular interest, political interests in France, they looked at the physical systems. They looked at how agriculture created the foundations, the food, the foundations for an economic system, and the monies that were generated from the foodstuffs moving through an economy would then help to support the shopkeepers, who would then sell things to dressmakers who would then um, also be sold to jewelers and then they would find their way towards the rich and the elite and so on. So they mapped out the physical movement of goods and services through an economy. They're the first real modelers in modern economics. At the same time, in England, a man called Bernard de Mandeville wrote a book called The Fable of the Bees. In the Fable of the Bees, he revolutionized the moral and ethical tenets that had already and always been there in most uh, philosophical, religious, and ethical um, treatises and ways of thinking about the world. And those traditional ways of thinking were that the most important thing was that people should be good, they should be moral, they should try and... Um, uh, cut back or they shouldn't um, be extravagant or greedy. And Mandeville in the Fable of the Bees says, no, that's absolutely wrong. What you should be doing is you should be spending as much as possible. You should be uh, being as greedy as possible because every individual greed of many, many people actually leads to the public good. If people weren't greedy, then the economic system would basically be stagnant and it would never grow. So Mandeville is the first person to develop a, a theory of how to be greedy in a way that seems to actually generate the public good. So powerful has this theory been, and it's not a very complicated theory, that it has been um, taken up by rich people ever since and is now the foundation for the Republican Party in the United States and most other places where you really need an ethical theory of why it's good to be greedy. What's really important about Mandeville's theory, apart from its influence on right-wing politics ever since, is that he's the first person to really show that you could actually have individual activities that have one quality and not knit them all together, and you'd actually come up with something quite different. So private vice, private greed, leads to the public good, according to Mandeville. This way of thinking, and the thinking of the physiocrats, owed quite a lot to a scientific set of developments, uh, most famously associated with Isaac Newton, where Isaac Newton came up with quite simple laws for how physical systems worked. And people who were in social systems thought, hey, we could do that. We could actually come up with 
a similar set of social laws that would be like the physical laws of gravity and so on that Newton had uh, created in the end of the 17th century. So it was a very strong movement to see, could we come up with very simple social laws that would explain how the complex economic systems work in a country like England or France and so on. And the person who finally brought it together in one uh, uh, synthesis was Adam Smith. And Adam Smith published in 1776 a book called The Wealth of Nations, which is considered to be the foundation document for modern economics. And in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith famously pointed out how the things that Mandeville and the physiocrats had been talking about worked um, in a whole um, system of um, uh, economic activity, of uh, foreign trade, and so on. Now, essential to the wealth of nations and work that followed on from this was that it came right at the very beginning of the modern development of capitalism. So one of the things about Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation, it is that it's sort of a guidebook for early capitalism. And in early capitalism, in this way of thinking about economics, um, everything, is, everything is describable and everything is showable in terms of markets. The thing about markets is that markets are organized according to price, that there's a price that it comes about by bringing together supplies of things and the demands of things, and together they knit together whole ranges of prices that people then spend their money on and that can be used to determine how much you need to pay people wages for labor, how much you can uh, spend to rent land, how much you need to do in order to invest, in order to buy what's called capital. Capital being the things that you need to accumulate in order to make other things. And that's one of the reasons why it's called capitalism. So in Smith's view of how an economic system works, the most important, the core idea is the idea of markets. And not just the kind of market you go to when you go to buy some tomatoes, but that everything in the economic system is kind of negotiated through different kinds of markets. Markets for goods, markets for services, markets for wages, markets for other things, and they all knit themselves together with prices. I'm excluding here for the moment government and taxes and other public activities, but at the core of this economic uh, model is a way of thinking about how an economic system is knitted together and how it, it communicates to people through the use of prices. The prices in the market tells you what something is worth. At about the same time, um, and through Adam Smith and other economists of that period, this raised a big question about what does it mean to value something? Why, why are some things more valuable than other things? Why is there more of a price to something uh, for this and not for other things? Why are diamonds priced more than, than water? We all need water to live, we don't need diamonds, but diamonds seem to be more valuable than water if they're being shown on a market and so on. So people had different theories of value. Is value associated with things that are scarce so that um, we need to be in conflict with each other so we bid up the price of diamonds because they're so scarce? Um, is water um, not uh, costable because it's everywhere and you can get water, but now we have water metering and so that actually means that there is a price for water and so on. So in the end of the Adam Smith era, there was this whole question about how do we know what things are worth? And this idea about what things are worth and how they are valued by an economic system is one of the foundation stones for alternative economics. Before I get to ecological economics, there are other alternatives that have been proposed over the last 150 years, um, and I'd just like to mention a couple of them. Um, one of them is a uh, economics called Gandhian economics, which is based on the activities of Mahatma Gandhi. And in Gandhian economics, what's most important is uh, a way of thinking about how to work, about a kind of spiritual um, village economics that depends for its power and impact on looking at work as a spiritual process and 
in that sense provides a particular alternative to the economics that we um, work with. Um, someone who was very strong influence on Gandhi was John Ruskin, a 19th century um, economist and philosopher and art critic who proposed in a book called Unto This Last that standard economics was flawed because its model of the person, the model of the self in it was completely wrong, that the model of the person in it, the idea that we are actually fundamentally selfish, that we are self-centered all the time and that we are looking after our own uh, personal needs is just not true that we have all kinds of concerns about other people. Ruskin's examples were mothers and children, but that he argued that actually the model of the person uh, in standard economics was a, uh, he would call it deracinated, um, small-minded version of how people actually do operate and sacrifice themselves and support other people in economic activities. And he, a bit like Gandhi and some other people in alternative economics, focused not so much on the way in which a pricing system worked, of which there had been a lot of controversy, but actually on whether the models of the human in economics, which, as I mentioned a moment ago, were based on a kind of model of uh, utilitarian, rational selfishness of people, that it was these models that were particularly flawed and that needed to be resolved. And Karl Marx and many other socialist um, economists um, believed that there is something called the labor theory of value. And the people who make something give value to the things that are being made. And that, weirdly enough, the people who are at the bottom, who are making the things in the factory work and so on, don't seem to be being paid as much as the people who own what Karl Marx called the means of production. They don't. They, those people, the people who own the means of production, seem to be making a lot more money than the people who are actually making things, and why is that? And Marx famously argued that this is a totally unjust way of actually organizing um, how an economic system should work, and that this way of thinking about um, value was crucial to making the political statements about who should be rewarded in an economic system and why is it that people are being exploited in an economic system um, as it currently stands. Towards the end of the 19th century, um, a number of uh, economists in various parts of the world, uh, Austria, Germany, um, France and England, came up with an alternative to the idea that somehow um, value is fundamentally uh, connected to labor and so on. And they came up with what is now called standard neoclassical economics. And their way of thinking about this was that the most important um, describer of value is actually the market itself. That is, what's really valuable is how things are priced in the market. It doesn't matter whether they've come from labor, whether they've come from intellectual activity. What's really important is how things are priced. And if everything is um, organizable through the markets, then things get a lot simpler in this model. And connected to that model is the idea that why are things valued that way in a market and because of a set of philosophical theories called utilitarianism, they argued that the way in which an economic system functions is that people, you and me, who are fundamentally selfish um, have more or less infinite capacity to be greedy, um, that we have preferences and our preferences and our needs are uh, organized according to our own personal preferences. They are, according to standard economics, they are um, organized according to various um, tables and models and things like that which we carry around in our heads. And that when we get into a market system, we actually negotiate between each other. We have conflicts with each other about what we want to buy and so on. But that to try and come up with some alternative theory of value, that is, maybe it should be gold, maybe it should be labor, maybe it should be something else, that no, the fundamental way of thinking about an economy is what people want to buy, what do they value, and the best way of finding out what they want to value is to ask the market the market gives you a set of prices and that tells you what things are worth. 
So unless it appears in the market, and unless it's got a price to it, it doesn't actually exist in standard neoclassical economics. This way of thinking about um, economics has been extremely powerful, and uh, out of that developed this idea of something called environmental economics, which is not ecological economics. It's a, it's a way of trying to think about the environment in economics because the pricing system doesn't work very well when you're dealing with things like water that I've already mentioned, or air, or other environmental goods that don't automatically find their way into an economic system or are rather complicated to try and work out what the price of the, of the thing is. So if you were trying to work out how much a tiger is worth, um, you, could buy, uh, you could buy and sell a tiger, you could strip it down for its tiger skin or the organs of the tiger and so on. But what about a tiger in the wild? Is the, does the tiger in the wild have a price on it? Uh, well, yes, you could probably sell it, but if you sell it, then you, um, you then sort of own a tiger and maybe you kill it and so on. But how do we value things that don't have an automatic economic value? And in the standard economic system, the only way, again, they get valued is if there is a price attached to them. So standard economics developed a whole way of thinking about this. And the way in which they developed was an idea, because everything depends upon markets, they developed this idea of things called externalities, which is a giveaway term. And the idea of externalities is how do we get things that are external to a market system and we punch them back into the economic system. And we do that in standard economics by, by a variety of sleights of hand. These include coming up with substitutes. They include finding um, ways to find out how people are already expressing a particular preference for a particular um, environmental good. Let me give you a couple of examples. One example would be if you are uh, running a park. Let's say in the Canadian context that you're running, you're part of the parks department. How do we know what a park is worth? How do we determine what a park is worth? Well, I could buy and sell the park, which doesn't make much sense. So one of the ways in which people try and find out a price for a park is by looking at how much people spend when they're in a park um, uh, on hunting gear, on fishing gear, on hiking gear, and so on. And they also look at what goes on around the park. So if you've ever spent time in a park in different parts of the world, you'll discover that right outside the park there are motels and restaurants and so on, people taking advantage of the park, and you can actually calculate the amount of money that is being spent there, and that's kind of a shadow price on what the park is actually worth. And then how much gasoline um, cost to get from, let's say, Toronto to some national park and so on. And so you can do all of that. And people who work in parks departments do this. There are economists who are trying to work out a way of getting a cost of this park onto the books. Because if it's not on the books, then people will say, yeah, but what's it worth? And maybe we could do something else. We could, we could uh, eliminate this park and we could build condos on it or something like that. So the question in our current society about whether something is worth tends to drift towards or be driven towards how much is it worth and how much is worth is an economic value. So that's one example. Um, another example would be um, whether or not um, you could find out how much people value economically a particular environmental good. One example, another example, would be um, if you look at the cost of houses around parks. So um, in the city where I live, which is Toronto, there are lots of parks, and the houses of the rich tend to be by these parks, which suggests that rich people like parks. Or they, maybe they don't like parks, but they like the view, they like um, being in an area that's got trees, and so on. So you can do a version of a kind of real estate analysis of how much people are willing to pay in order to live near or around uh, a natural environment. How much um, in this particular part of the world is such and such worth. Another way of doing this in standard economics, although it begins to drift into more complicated areas, is whether or not the activity, let's call it the activity of a 
of a park or a swamp, wetland or a swamp, whatever it might be, how much is it worth if you decided to get rid of it and replace it with something else? This is sometimes called um, uh, alternative valuation or substitute um, effects and so on. So um, a good example would be New York City. New York City, over 120 years ago or so, very intelligently um, developed a uh, way of importing water um, to New York from reserv reservoirs north of the city. These are lakes and other areas north of, the, north of New York City. And about 10 or 15 years ago, there was a proposal because uh, the land around the lakes and things like that was being built up and it was becoming expensive to maintain um, the reservoirs and so on, that this should be eliminated and there should be a kind of an artificial system that would be created, which would include um, a range of treatment plants and so on. And when they decided to take a look at this, they had a commission that took a look at this, and they discovered that to come up with a substitute for what the natural system was doing with help from the engineers in New York and so on, that to come up with a substitute would probably cost, I don't know, about, like so call it $10 billion. So instead of doing that, they actually spent $2 billion and they bought up land around the reservoirs. They actually reconstituted and, uh, and um, did some restoration work on the original um, landscape. So one of the questions that's raised by that is, does this mean that the natural area is worth $10 billion? Because they, you substituted only $2 billion, so maybe $8 billion would be an equivalent. Um, so um, to, to, to get rid of the natural system, that means that the natural system is worth about $10 billion. People have done this for the whole planet. People have said the natural systems of the planet are worth a trillion dollars and the, the activities that the natural system um, carries out are worth that much amount of money. You'll notice that this, again, is drifting dramatically into the idea of pricing natural systems, that, that the natural world should be given a price so that we, people will take it seriously. Now, people who work in ecological economics, some of whom have actually carried out this kind of work, um, have, have very gingerly stepped into this area because, of course, it looks like you're now trying to turn the natural world into yet another object that can be bought and sold. But they're doing this in part as a rhetorical gesture to point out, look, natural systems actually have um, economic importance. It's just they can't be um, all the time or automatically turned into money value. So this brings me to ecological economics. Ecological economics um, is a, an area of economics that was created over the last 80 to 100 years, but it has a, a long rooted tradition, starting particularly with the physiocrats, of looking at the actual physical processes of the planet. It was started in part by people who were doing Again, a version of the physiocrats, which is what is the, the actual physical processes, the inputs, the outputs, the ways uh, in which the natural world and the social world of human beings actually interact and work together. And um, there were a number of um, very brilliant um, people who became uh, concerned about the ecological future and started to think about what an alternative economic system might look like. One of the most famous was a, a Quaker economist called Kenneth Boulding. And Kenneth Boulding pointed out in the early 1960s that um, you could define two different kinds of economy. One of them was what he called the cowboy economy. And the cowboy economy was, had a set of images of an infinite frontier that, it, that we could constantly and forever go on uh, creating infinite um, resources, that we would uh, indulge ourselves indefinitely. And um, he was polemically trying to point out that it's a kind of a cowboy world um, with which we are, alas, only too familiar. At this time, because of the space program, Kenneth Boulding also pointed out that another alternative was what he called the spaceship economy, based on the idea of spaceship Earth. The spaceship economy is one where you actually have to uh, recycle, where you have to use the resources that you are given, 
and that you have to be very, very careful not to overshoot and overuse the resources that you have to work with. And Kenneth Boulding and others pointed out that this in fact is our situation on Earth and it is getting more and more um, acute that the cowboy economy with which we have been living for the last 100, 200 years is, has to be replaced with some form of what he called a spaceship uh, Earth economy. An important ecological economist by the name of Herman Daly produced two very interesting and important ideas. The first was this idea of a, an empty world and a full world. What Daly argued was that when um, the world was emptier of people, that's why it's called an empty world, why it was, when it was emptier of people, we were able to extract resources from the natural world, we could throughput them, that's a phrase that he uses, and that we would be able, at the end of it, to throw out or um, use the weight, put the waste resources somewhere into Earth, and the natural system would be able to actually recycle them. As the world has become fuller, and as now the economic system has basically become a full-scale uh, enterprise on the Earth, we now have a situation where the extraction of resources and the ability to, um, as it were, um, throw them away at the end of their lifetime has extraordinarily burdened the planet. Not only is the extraction of resources become very burdensome, but we discover with climate change, with toxic chemicals, with pollution in general, that the planet is having a very difficult time of actually recycling um, the things that we have thrown away. So between the empty world and the full world, we now find ourselves in a quite a different situation when the idea could be vaguely um, bruited that we might possibly live on an infinite planet. Now we find ourselves essentially with a planet which is having to cope with a full-scale economic uh, set of activities. And out of that, he has also described, as with other ec ecological economists, the relationship between what's called natural capital, you'll notice I'm using the term capital again, natural capital, which are the natural resources we have around, which we need at the basis of whatever production systems we generate, that in the empty world, that natural capital was substantial and that we could use whatever tools that we were using, axes and so on, we could use them to create again, logs or whatever it might be, and that, because our burden wasn't very um, heavy, we could um, happily continue. When we find ourselves in a full world, not only is natural capital being extracted uh, at an extraordinary rate, so we're running out of natural capital, but we have actually made most of our investment and our expenditure in man-made capital, in human-made capital, and that has increased to the point where, as I said before, it uh, raises big questions about whether we can manage our economic system into the future. And then, of course, we have to deal with all of the throughput, which a now an ex expanded human uh, set of activities is generating for the planet. So, out of this way of thinking about the way in which natural capital is being exploited, about how it's being overtaken by the burden of human-made capital, and that the throughput of resources is now burdening the planet with the waste products that we have, we are generating from the production, but also the use of the materials after they've been produced, we find ourselves faced with a series of policy questions that have changed, ought to change, the way in which we manage the resources of a finite planet. Some of this is to try and make sure that we do not overuse the natural resources of the planet. So we need to invest and reinvest in the restoration and regeneration of the natural systems. If we log all of the forests in order to get logs, then there is no more logs. So we need to be, make sure that the natural capital is still with us. We also need to, on a finite planet, if we're going to continue to generate the kind of uh, materials and services that people want, we have to use them much more efficiently. So if we're going to invest in human-made capital, it has to be made much more efficient and it has to become much less wasteful. And of course, we have to also think about renewable resources, about cradle-to-cradle -cradle or cradle-to-grave uh, management 
of resources so that we actually minimize the amount of wastefulness that the planet needs to actually recycle on our behalf. These are very powerful um, outcomes of the original vision of what it is that we are currently doing to the uh, natural resources of the planet and how our current focus on our um, pushing natural resources through ever-increasing industrial manufacturing processes is actually threatening the future of the planet and ourselves. This way of physically looking at the material processes that we find ourselves in is one of the reasons why uh, for people who work in ecological economics they are concerned with things like the scale of our economic activities, the materials that we're using, the efficiency with which we're using these materials, and whether or not this way of using the materials of the world is fundamentally sustainable over long periods of time. This alternative which is called ecological economics, that is, it's based in part on looking at the ecology, the natural ecology of the world, is surprisingly enough not available in standard economics. Standard economics looks like it, it, it concerns itself with the physical world, but it doesn't really. Everything in standard economics is mediated by prices. If it doesn't have a price on it, it doesn't really exist. It's assumed by standard neoclassical economics that the price mechanism will eventually recognize the fact that we're running out of certain things and therefore the price will go up and so on. But there are all kinds of complicated wrinkles in uh, economics that make it very difficult for that to happen. And one of the things that we discover is that there are a lot of um, economic activities that are not only wasteful but seem to have been able to drive um, whole economic systems into, uh, if not complete collapse, near collapse. This includes the cod fisheries, it includes the uh, endangerment of species, and so on. Ecological economics is driven by and is based on um, a particular ecology, a way of thinking about how the natural world works, which includes both the complexity of ecosystems and also that there are certain physical and um, what we call thermodynamic limits to the ways in which we can use energy and the uh, complex resources that we need in order to make the things that we may need to make. So at the core of uh, how alternative economics, al ecological economics, um, is proceeding, and it is still in development at the moment, is to take this picture of the world, the physical world in which we actually operate, and the currently increasing burden of human activities, and to work out alternative policies, work out alternative ways of trying to think about how we use the resources of the planet for not just our sustainability, but for our flourishing in the future. And out of this idea, uh, there were this vision of how the world works, a number of these policies are developing. These include different ways of measuring um, the things that we buy and sell. We currently operate on something called Gross National Product, GNP, and there are alternative uh, models that ecological economists have uh, come up with and derived, and these really are trying to measure not just how much stuff we have, but whether it's they're providing us with sustainable services, whether they're making us happy, whether they're increasing our welfare, and so on. Because if the whole point of an economic system is not to increase human well-being and welfare, then what is it for? Other alternatives include how to think about restoring and sustaining the natural capital, I'm using the word capital again, but this time in to connecting it to the natural systems, how do we actually restore and sustain the natural capital that we need in order to actually operate the industrial manufacturing production processes that we live with, and of course to think about what it is we actually need to have in order to sustain ourselves. Can we go on the way we're going on with a kind of an infinite um, desiring, the idea that the planet is infinite, and so on. Ecological economics um, is against this as a model and is actually using uh, 
the actual facts, the physical facts of the planet on which we live, and the actual activities that people are engaged in to um, propose uh, another, an alternative to the way in which the standard model, which has been locked into capitalism and the models of progress and development for the last 200 years, and ecological economics is designed to provide um, an alternative. It is part of uh, a range of alternative economic models, um, ranging again from socialism to anarchism to different religious forms of economics, um, Buddhist economics and others, and is part of that whole drive towards thinking about alternatives to standard economics. I believe that ecological economics provides the most powerful and it has now, because of modelers and other alternative economists like Peter Victor and my old university of uh, York University and uh, Tim Jackson in England and a whole range of people thinking about um, what an alternative eco ecological economics might look like who are generating not just a, a, a nice idea but actual models and uh, detailed policies of what an alternative economics would look like. And without such an alternative economics, our potential for uh, happiness flourishing and possibly sustaining our survival on the planet will be at stake. And that is why I wanted to discuss and describe ecological economics for you today. Thank you.